So before I start my sermon, I have to tell you something really ironic that happened this morning. Uh, we, it has been so cold in our house that we decided to open up our fireplace and have a fire last night. And it was lovely. It was very nice. And before bed, we poured about four liters of water on the fire and made sure the smoke was out and went to bed and closed the flue and went to bed. And when we woke up this morning, I woke up at six in the morning to finish my sermon and our house was completely full of smoke. So... We spent much of the morning running around opening up all the doors, so much for warming up because of the fire. So our house is very, very, very cold right now, but thankfully everyone is safe and fine. Please know if you haven't checked the batteries in your smoke detectors, please do that. Let this be a lesson to you to check the batteries, make sure they're working. But I thought it was so funny because the title of my sermon is Baptized by the Holy Spirit. And the whole idea of the Holy Spirit is it comes through fire and it is not easily quenched or easily put out. And we literally had to take the log that was still smoking this morning in our fireplace and put it in a bucket and then dump like a whole thing of water and basically submerge it to put it out. So I hope the Holy Spirit is like that today as well and that it just won't go out no matter what we try to do to it. So I wanted to look at this passage. So at first it looks like a really straightforward passage. This is essentially usually labeled, this is when Jesus goes and gets baptized by John the Baptist. But John the Baptist is such a strange figure in this story. So if you think about him, so he's born within a year of Jesus' birth. He's just a little bit older. And he lives out in the desert. And it's said he's kind of a wild figure. He lives in the wilderness. He probably smells like smoke like I do right now. So sorry for that. And uh, he eats locusts and honey. And yet it's said that so many people come out to visit him. It said the whole Judean region and all the people of Jerusalem we're seeking him and asking to be baptized by him. And so I'm wondering why they're doing this. I, are they all going out because they want to get his locust recipes? What's the reason for this? Why would they go into the desert? It's so hot and dusty. They don't have a GPS system at that time. It can't be that easy to find. And it says so many people are seeking him out. And if we know from other stories about John the Baptist, he's not the most friendly person. So you might remember in Luke 3, where he's yelling at the crowds that come to see him and calling them, you broods of vipers, who told you to flee from the coming wrath. So this isn't like a very friendly person. This doesn't seem like someone that all the crowds in Jerusalem are going to go seeking and wanting to get his counsel. But it's said that they are. So I'm wondering what's going on at this time that everyone is seeking out John the Baptist. So if we know during this period, people... The Jewish people are living under the brutality of the Roman Empire, and many of them are looking for answers. So in this way, it's a little similar to what we think about in society now, where there's a lot of upheaval with climate change, with political systems changing, with so many wars, and so we're having more spiritual seekers, so to speak, at this time. And so a lot of sex had arisen at this point uh, within the Jewish tradition of trying to kind of figure out what can we do spiritually, how can we address the oppression and the concerns that we have at this time. So many people are unhappy with the traditions that they grow up in. Uh, they see their Jewish leaders as either attempting to placate the Roman officials who are there or as being completely powerless in the face of the empire. So they started trying to seek out different answers and looking for people like John the Baptist. So some of the sects at the time are the Pharisees, who we hear a great deal of, and they're traditional uh, Jewish leaders who believe that if we keep the laws and please God, God will save us from oppression. So if we kind of double down on the laws at this time, that's what will keep us safe, protect us. There are also the Sadducees, who are the most elite group At this period, they worked with the most wealthy Jews at the time, and they also worked in tandem with the Roman officials, so very much collaborating with the Romans. The Essenes were another group that John the Baptist has a few things in common with. So they live in Qumran, just alongside the Dead Sea, so out in the wilderness, but they believe in a monastic life. So saying, okay, our whole society is messed up, nothing's working, so we have to abandon society. So if we go out, we'll form a new society. They believe in a lot of um, ritual cleansing, so in that way, similar to the baptisms that John's doing, although slightly different, which I can touch on soon, uh, but really kind of abandoning society. And monasticism is the thing that will protect us. There were the Herodians, who were both Jews and Romans, who supported King Herod. 
King Herod himself is Jewish, but his father was a Roman official, and he's the vassal of the Roman Empire, so just completely under Roman control. So there are people who follow him who say, okay, well, the Romans have control here. I guess we just have to go along with what they want. And finally, there were the zealots, who were kind of a bunch of different groups that were seeking a political uprising to overthrow the Romans in that way. So under these groups, people felt like these were the choices, spiritually, they had at that time, were to try to follow the law fastidiously and pray that God will save them, to give up autonomy and try to learn how to live under the control of the Romans and just doing whatever they wanted, to actively fight against the empire and likely get killed, as Jesus later was, even though he wasn't fighting in that way, uh, or to abandon their families and take up a monastic lifestyle. So these are their options. So this is before John the Baptist. But suddenly you have someone who kind of has a few of these things happening. So he does live out, out in the wilderness. But, so, and he has an ascetic lifestyle um, like the uh, Essenes. But he doesn't want to abandon society. Instead, he wants society to come to him. He wants society to change and to repent. And he said, we have to repent of our sins. It's our sins. We haven't been doing things in the right way. We have to cleanse ourselves of the way we've been doing things so we can be prepared for a new way of doing things and for the Messiah. And that really did appeal to a lot of people. So that's why they were seeking him out. And most surprisingly, even Jesus sought him out and decided to get baptized. So many in the Christian church associate baptism with John the Baptist. But I think it's important to know that there was baptism before this. And the main group that would get baptized before John uh, were actually Gentiles who were seeking to convert into Judaism. But by the way John was doing it, he was baptizing not just Gentiles, but also Jews, and saying this is something that we must all do together. It isn't just the Romans who have to change to become more like the Jews. And it isn't just the Jews who have to follow the law. It's that everyone together has to change how we're doing things. And that's a message that appealed to Jesus, that Jesus sought him out. So it's very surprising that Jesus came to see him and most likely be yelled at by John, as he was yelling at everyone. Uh, so, so Jesus did come and repented of his sins. And there are a few ways of understanding that. So there are some people who kind of focus on the humanness of Jesus, say, okay, if he fully embraced humanity, then he also had to embrace the parts of us that aren't so perfect. So in seeing John and repenting of this, he says, okay, I too want to be a part of this. But then even if you see Jesus as fully divine, you can say this is his way of kind of being in this new change in society and embracing that fully and saying, okay, if all these people, Romans, Gentiles, and Jews are all coming to John, I too want to do that. And I think that that's the core of the message. I thought it was really interesting when John says, I'm going to baptize you with water, but someone who's more powerful than me is coming, and he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So there's something about being baptized by the Holy Spirit that's more powerful than the way baptisms were done before, and more powerful than water. Again, as my story tells you, clearly fire is more powerful than water. You have to be very careful with fire. <laughs> but I think that's kind of what's setting the stage for Jesus. And then the thing that was so important about Jesus' message is he wasn't saying the Jews have to abandon their Judaism and they have to change completely and you know, leave all of their laws. Instead, he's saying the Jews are fine the way they are, they have the laws, but also this is opened up in a new way now to all. So we can have one faith that everyone can access God. And then the thing that's so amazing about the Holy Spirit is it can just come to you instantly. So when the Holy Spirit comes to the people in Acts, suddenly they can understand one another and they can preach. When it comes throughout the stories in the Bible, when God's Spirit comes, it changes everything. It goes over the waters and it creates life. It creates new things that were not possible before. And that's so powerful. So before, if you had to say, okay, we have to focus on our sinfulness and we must cleanse ourselves to change things, and it's focused on this kind of cleansing, the Holy Spirit says, no, I can just come instantly. I can give you this kind of power we didn't have before. So as Reverend Jeff was saying earlier, tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and he's someone who's often understood as having an immense amount of the Holy Spirit working through him. He was the Reverend Doctor 
Martin Luther King. He had done so much amazing work through the church and really using Christian values and the teachings of Jesus to try to change society in this beautiful way. I read uh, in the book Questions of Life, Nikki Gumbel tells a story about him and how the Holy Spirit impacted him early on in his ministry. It said that in 1955, Dr. King was arrested on a petty speeding charge in his hometown of Montgomery, Alabama. He was organizing a boycott then because of the segregation of the city buses. But after he kept getting harassed by the local police and started getting death threats, Dr. King got very scared. And he thought, maybe I have to abandon this. Maybe, you know, how are you going to change the law? How are we going to fight back against oppression? That's so much bigger than me. I'm just going to get myself killed. I'm not going to be able to make a difference. But instead, he started praying about this and praying to God for help. And Dr. King says he heard a voice telling him to call on the power that can make a way out of no way. That's the direct quote. He said he heard that. That's what God told him is the Holy Spirit can make a way out of no way. And as the divine presence filled him, he suddenly had courage that he didn't have before. And he said, my uncertainty disappeared. Suddenly I was ready to face anything. So suddenly that kind of power, and you can hear that in any of his talks, in any of his lectures and sermons and books, you can see that God was working through Dr. King. He had this unbelievable perseverance, just this complete presence. Um, you, the, the kind of work he could do, by all accounts, didn't make any sense. Just these everyday people and ministers trying to stand up against society that wants to squash any kind of voices against them. But instead, you can see how God could work through him and inspire new people to bring people out of their safe, comfy lives, suddenly wanting to go down, wanting to march to Selma, even though like dogs were being sicked on them, they were being sprayed with fire hoses, rocks were thrown at them, they're being attacked by white people that want to maintain the status quo. But suddenly having black and white and people of all different races, all different backgrounds, hearing the voice of God through Dr. King and saying, you know what, you're right, our society has to change. It has to become equal for all people. We're going to, no matter what happens to us, no matter how many people get sent to prison, no matter who is killed, even we know that this is what God wants for our society, that that's God's dream. So to be able to hear that from him and through him is just so powerful. And I think that's something that we can hear in society. I know for me, from a Buddhist perspective, I'll hear someone sometimes and say, oh, they're a bodhisattva. They're like an awakened being, someone that has that connection to God or that connection to their Buddha nature or divine force. And I think we can hear that. If you've ever heard Dr. King's very last talk, uh, it was given, uh, it's his I've been to the mountaintop speech that was given, given at the Mason Temple, Temple in Memphis, Texas on April 3rd, 1968. It was the day before he was killed. And you can listen to it on YouTube. And if you just listen to it, he's saying, you know what, I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the promised land. I know that these changes are going to happen. I know I'm not going to be there with you when these changes happen, but I know that they're going to happen. It's like when Moses is on the mountaintop at Mount Nebo in Jordan, and he's looking down, and you can see the entire promised land of Israel and Palestine, but he knows he himself can't go. And the very next day, Dr. King was killed. And so people say he had that gift of prophecy. He knew he was going to die, but he, he was totally courageous and still willing to fight for what he knew God wanted right up until his last day. It's just so powerful. So I completely believe when John the Baptist says that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is more powerful than the baptism of water. When Jesus comes after me, he's more powerful than anything we've seen before. I think we can see that, and we can feel that kind of power. And I hope that that's the kind of power that we have in this church, the power to try to live into God's dream, to be able to take it in, to feel it in us, and to know that when we hear that voice, and it says, we have to fight for the good of all. We have to stand against oppression. We want every single one to be saved, including up to the last sheep. I think we can hear that, and I pray that we'll have the courage to live into that as we let the Holy Spirit come to us. Amen.